Um, so first of all, we've got Mutone uh, Mwajere uh, from Nairobi. If we can, uh, uh, if you'd like to ask your question live, please, please go ahead. Mutoni. Are you there? Hey, this is Mabani. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Oh, please go ahead. We can hear you. This is Mabani Wanyaki. I had several questions, but I will respect Alex and ask one. Um, how do you reconcile your stance as a defender of the Constitution today with the fact that you mobilized the no vote in the constitutional referendum of 2010? Thank you. Thank you, Mutoni. Um, we also have uh, something, a program here called our Common Futures Conversations. And so our next two questions will be from young members of, our, of that project. Uh, for your information, Deputy President, the Common Futures Conversations project at Chatham House is a centenary initiative. We celebrated our centenary in 2019 that uses a bespoke online platform to provide space for young people in Africa and Europe to share perspectives on key global issues and engage in policy makers. We've received many questions from them, uh, and we've chosen two to, to ask their questions live to you. So first of all, I'd like to invite Salome Nuzuku to ask the, the question. Salome, please go ahead. Um, thank you for the opportunity to ask this question. My name is Salome Ndenyanzuki. I am a founding member of the Common Futures Conversations community and also a Chatham House Youth Advisory Panelist. Currently, I work at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs here in Kenya. Excellency Deputy President, how will you tackle violence against women, safeguard women's rights, and promote gender equality if elected as the fifth president of Kenya? Thank you. Thank you very much. And then the second question is from uh, Daniel Orogo. Daniel, please go ahead. Hello, um, my name is Daniel Orogo. I am from Nairobi, Kenya. I am a member of uh, the Chatham House Future Conversation Program, and uh, I am a panelist in the political governance. Uh, Your Excellency, the Deputy President, President Kenyatta has admitted uh, several uh, in different platforms, uh, that there is nothing he can do with, to do to fight corruption. In fact, he has, in one occasion, thrown up his hands on air and says that there is nothing he can do. What do you want me to do? So as part of the presidency that you have been part of, I am interested um, to hear how you have seen in your campaigns that you do not really articulate about corruption. And I've heard your presentation about uh, the fund, about institutionalization. But I admit that it is tummy until late that you two have been dodgy about your agenda about fighting corruption. Is it by default? And if so, what is your pragmatic agenda in tackling corruption under your presidency if you will be elected? Thank you so much. Thank you, Daniel. And the final question is from uh, Uredo Makoji, which is one about tourism, I believe. Uredo, please go ahead. No? No, you're ready? OK. Um, maybe you answer okay. the, the, those questions. OK. Maybe let me start with Wanyeki. Um, let me tell Wanyeki, I am a Democrat. And when you are a Democrat, when you participate in a contest, and you lose or win, you must accept the outcome of that contest. We went to a referendum. Yes, I mobilized the no vote because I, have mis I had misgivings about sections, not the whole constitution, sections of that constitution. But when the people of Kenya decided that this is the constitution they want to have, as a Democrat, I had to accept that this now is our document. And I have every right to defend the current constitution because it is the constitution of the Republic of Kenya. And I am a Kenyan. It is uh, a paradox that William Ruto, who had misgivings about sections of the constitution, 
today is the defender of the Constitution against the people who pushed for the, uh, for the adoption of the Constitution, who today have become the biggest enemies of the same Constitution. They want to mutilate the same Constitution. And it has to take William Ruto to defend the Constitution of Kenya. Isn't it an irony? I think the people on the other side have more questions to answer than, than I do. Um, Salome. I quite agree with Salome that um, we must be even. It is, we are, we are the losers when we exclude women from the leadership of our nation. We have seen the value of women leaders. We have seen the contributions that they make. I have nominated no less than four women who have gone ahead to win elections because they've been given a chance to serve. So the more women, the more we provide opportunity for women to participate in, in leadership, the better for everybody. And that's why, even in the BBI process, I was against getting women from elected positions and making them nominees, you know, of, of people, their friends, their relatives, their girlfriends, and all the rest of it. We must continuously provide a platform for women to be elected, for them to participate in elective politics. What are we doing? As a party, for every elective post, women pay for nominations half what, we, what men pay, as a rule. Number two, we have made it absolutely clear it is in the rules of our party that any violence is an automatic ticket to disqualification, especially violence against women. So violence in a, is a no-go zone in, in our party. Violence against women has the severest consequences because we need to provide the opportunity for women to participate in, in the leadership of our nation. And going forward, we will support the affirmative action components that ensures that e uh, representation progressively until we have parity on matters to do with gender becomes our part of our equation until we get everybody the opportunity to be elected. Um, David, mm, I don't remember what uh, David was asking. Can you remind me, David? Corruption. Yes, good. David was asking about the subject of corruption. And precisely, he's captured it very well, that there are so many people who pontificate about uh, the, the fight against corruption. He said, President Kenyatta at some point said there was nothing he could do. I think that's a question he need to direct to President Kenyatta. I would not throw up my hands that I have nothing to do. I have something to do. I need to get the criminal justice system to have its own financial independence, give them the capacity, the software, the human capital, the hardware, to deal with corruption. I have uh, uh, said that I will roll out the judiciary fund to enable the judiciary to deal with accountability by providing them the human resource, the financial independence, the hardware and software to be able to adjudicate over matters and to deal with corruption cases expeditiously. Part of the lethargy around corruption 
is because it takes 10 years for a corruption case to be dealt with. Why? Because the whole investigation chain is, 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 is lethargic, and the judiciary do not have the capacity to fast track because they are constrained financially because we haven't made it possible for them to have that capacity to deal with matters to do with corruption. I have been very clear in my mind as to why the fight against corruption is top on our priority by institutionalizing the fight against corruption. And it is not going to be something personal between me and my friends or my enemies. It is something between the criminals and the law. And, 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 and in my very uh, honest opinion, the rest of the people who are uh, giving us long lectures about corruption, it is public knowledge in Kenya that there are people who run uh, a laundry to clean, you know, corrupt people, you know? If you are a corrupt person, you just need to pass through some office, pay some small stipend, and all of a sudden you are a clean person, you have no case to answer. I don't think that's what fighting corruption is all about. I don't think personalizing uh, the fight against corruption so that it is me versus my enemies. That's not how to fight corruption. The way to fight corruption is to build the institutions that can independently deal with the challenge of corruption. One final thing. Willie Mutunga, our former Chief Justice, when he left office, he said the one thing that he was very happy about is that the telephone line never rang with a call from State House. In four years that he was Chief Justice, not one day, it never rang. And he was very proud of it. Because that's how to keep the independence of institutions and to make sure that every institution does its job. And that's the essence of why the Constitution set up independent institutions to deal with weighty matters like oversight, accountability, uh, the, and the whole criminal justice system. Okay, too many hands <laughs> for the time we've got. Um, so, the, so you've had your hand up almost all the way through, so that might be that it's your lucky moment because it's a, such a strong arm. But you have to be quick, yeah? Just one question sharp. Please Thank go you. ahead. Thank you. Uh, the, the Deputy President, my question to you, and this is to be fair to your competitors, it's not that they don't have an agenda. They have a very potent agenda. And to quote um, uh, Abraham Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, when America was at the point of dissolution, made a very great speech about a house divided against itself cannot stand. And as a man of, uh, uh, a man of faith, are you saying the unity call by your competitors is not, not worthy? Seeing that Kenya has been divided since independence and the presidency has been circulating amongst two tribes and, this, and, and the unity call and the marginalization of Kenyans is, is not an agenda? You're saying it's an old story? I really want to hear how, what you would respond to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the lady in the middle just here. Yes, please. It's coming. Yep. Your opportunity. Thank you very much. My name is um, Karen Juguna. I am a midwife here in the UK. I trained and practice here. And my question is around health. Uh, women's health and sexual reproductive health is, is an issue that's close to my heart. So I would like to ask, what are the plans for your government to tackle the high maternal mortality rate in Kenya? As you know, Africa as a whole, uh, we contribute to two thirds of maternal death in the world. And um, Kenya has um, its fair share. And, and also um, to ask what your opinion is in terms of um, 
legalizing abortion, which is one of the highest contributors of maternal mortality and, and how we can evolve <coughs> these conversations that are very emotive and also um, very driven by our faith. But as a profession, putting my professional hat on, I think that we need to have this discussion. Women need to have choice and also look at ways in, in how we can uh, prevent women from dying from preventable causes. Um, I know there's a lot of work that has been done uh, by the Beyond Zero campaign, and it would be interesting to see how you can, what are your plans in terms of building on that and ensuring that no woman should die from preventable causes in childbirth. Thank you very much. And then the last, okay, and then we'll have that, do. so go ahead, okay. and then we'll do one final Shibi, round. We can, yeah. we can meet later. <laughs> My good brother, I didn't get his name uh, at the back, uh, um, says, uh, am I dismissing the calls of unity? By no means, no, I'm not dismissing the calls of unity. I just want a bit of honesty and decency around those calls. When we went and we were told that we were having the handshake and it was about the unity of the country, it never turned out that it was a conspiracy. It, it wasn't genuine, you know? What happened? There was no unity. There was no building bridge. There was nothing. What happened? The handshake destroyed Jubilee, the, the ruling party. The handshake destroyed NASA, the uh, opposition coalition. The handshake destroyed our big four plan. We couldn't implement it. The handshake destroyed government as we knew it. There was no government, there was no opposition. We ended up in a conundrum that nobody knew who was in the opposition. Who was. So as we called for unity, is it the unity of the leaders, or is it the unity of the people? It is, it is, it is way different because there is a, a push by our competitors that the unity they understand is that if you have three, four, five leaders from their communities deciding to work together, that is unity, and every Kenyan should be satisfied with it. We hold a different view. We believe that the unity of the nation will be built around getting everybody included. The inclusion, the political inclusion. Well, that's why we are building a national political movement. That's why we are building a national political party. That's why we and our competitors and, and, our, and, our, and our friends, we are building a national political formation. Economic inclusion. It's not that when a leader has occupied an office, he has occupied an office on behalf of his community. No. It is the economic inclusion that will create the unity of the nation. And to speak to you directly, if if, if you want to tell us today that we want, you want us to believe you, that you are genuine about the unity of the country, you know? And you have just come from your commitment. You said, this is my commitment. This is my word as a leader. You've walked away from it. In fact, I consider the, 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 the so-called unity, you know, people running away from their commitments, people running away from what they have committed to other leaders. And if you can lie, if you can cheat, if you can betray a fellow leader, what will you do to the people of Kenya? Huh? So, I mean, really, we have to be honest about this thing, you know, and that's, that's we must speak candidly as Kenyans to these issues. Let's not gloss over big words. Oh, you know, unity of the country, a second liberation, Mandela moment. No, I mean, this is all nonsense. I'm sorry.
I mean, we really must just speak to the, to the real issues that bring people together. Um, health. Health is a very big issue. In fact, it's just that he squeezed time out of me. <laughs> That's one thing that is at the heart of this conversation. We had a whole program on universal health. Unfortunately, we couldn't, we couldn't deal with it because we ended up chasing the BBI stories and the rest of it. So what is our plan? We managed uh, this year. In fact, three, three months ago, we managed to pass the changes to the law to make it possible for us to re-engineer the whole health space and make it possible for us to get to universal health coverage that carries with it your concerns on how women access health and how the citizens of Kenya access health. We now have the law that will give us a graduated contribution mechanism where people earning six figures like myself can pay more, and the people down the pyramid can pay less. And it is our considered view coming from experts and uh, complete with actuarial uh, expertise that it is possible under the new arrangement for us to double, if not triple, the resources that will be available to manage our health under our new health program as passed by the law in Parliament. That way, we can be able to deliver health in a much more predictable, quality health in a, in a, in a, in a better way. And with it, you know, uh, when we came into office uh, in 2013, okay, I remember, I think it was in 2015, we then said that government of Kenya will pay through National Hospital Insurance Fund for every mother who gives birth. Many women avoided going to hospital because they could not afford, but we made it possible that every child must be born with health professionals in place. And that's why significantly we have reduced uh, maternal deaths. With our, with our universal health coverage properly rearranged, that will scale up uh, uh, those interventions. On matters to do with abortion, the law is very clear in Kenya until it is changed that uh, if the health or the well-being or the survival of the mother is in, is in jeopardy, doctors are legally given the permission to save the life of the mother. So that the provision on where life is in danger is already captured by our law. Maybe then, uh, unless you're talking about something much more progressive, then that's another discussion. Kenya is a democratic country. We will have a conversation. And when we get to that place where we make that decision, then we will implement it in whatever fashion that the law will provide at that point in time. Um, Mushiri, Mushibi, sorry, yeah, on what guarantees do we have to make sure that we are not transiting for this 